clattering in the bone chamber of our skull. And the little insanities which creep up from our throat, our teeth, good soldiers holding their ground, grind them down in our sleep. And praise to the wolf with his sharp incisors, the better to eat, and the ice maiden's teeth, sheathed in enamel, biting clean through the bone. Oh, we would never depart from our eye teeth, rooted dependably above our unremarkable necks. And who is not awed by the white buds of milk teeth that creep from red plushness and become the cutting edge? I would have written a new book of poems for you if you didn't ask for that. Okay, I'll read my last poem. Will be a kind of depressing one, but for some reason for me is so visual. And I was going to say that a lot of the poets here are from the last 20 or 30 years in Israel. Um, contemporary poetry now is not obsessed with war and the Bible and all that. I'll just tell you one funny story. Um, I went to a reading by an Israeli writer the other day and he said the issue with Hebrew is not a good or a bad translation. It's how high or how low. And what they mean by that, since Hebrew is, comes from the Old Testament, the language is full of biblical terms. And of course, they weren't biblical terms for ice cream, so that made its way into a language. But high means very biblical. And Moshe, like my husband, liked to speak very high because it was a beautiful Hebrew. So he was once translating a book of Vlad the Vegetarian um, Vampire. It was a children's book. And he gave it to the publisher. I'll never forget this. And the publisher went, Moshe. Moshe. Because <laughs> it was too elevated. Okay, last one. Song of the Disabled Ex-Serviceman. Every two of us have three eyes. Every five, eight hands. Rub more roughly than usual the hair on the head. Rub this time with all your fingers. You'll finally recall a face so intimate in memories you once lived. Every two of us have three shoes. Every five, eight gloves. Thank you very much. more food out there and more wine and perhaps the ambassador would like to have a final word but uh, we also could look at these two wonderful poets we could ask them questions like how's the election going in Israel right now and we don't want to get too political or anything but Mr. Ambassador if you want to say something are there any questions do you all owe these tonight or they're going to close the official part questions Talk to Barbara and Tom about anything at all and their work or what's going on. It's up to you. You don't have to say anything, but you know. Should we turn and look at the audience? Yeah, yeah. Bring a chair up, Tom. You both sit down. Whatever. Bring a chair up, Tom. Whatever. I just want to say what an unusual book Barbara's book is because translators are so often hidden and unappreciated and um, self-effacing. And in this instance, it's really the making of a translator. And that's very unusual. And I do wish there were more of your work in, in the book. But I also appreciate your, you know, your sort of exposition about how you became who you are and how you relate to the work that you did. And um, I think it's a beautiful book. And I just oh, want to appreciate it. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Well, I just want to say, I, I planted her. I mean, she, that's, that's exactly what I did. Thank you.
exactly what it was, just like what kind of background does a self-effacing translator come from? Like I'm self-effacing. Well, there's more. Oh, there's a yes, please. <laughs> question about the foundation and, and the legacy of William Meredith and the sort of the poetics of William Meredith. And you could sort of speak a little bit about the poetics of William Meredith, the kind of poetry that that he espoused or promoted or, or left for all of us to, to sort of carry on with. And, and you know, the choices he made as a poet. A complex guy, there were three things that he built his life on. Trees, students, and poetry. Those are the three, uh, the, the tripod on which he built his life. And he, of course, was a military um, pilot in World War II and in Korea. So the early work, which won uh, the, um, the Yale series of younger poets, Archibald MacLeish chose him for that were all really lyrical, wonderful poems about flying this machine, you know, and when the wings went out, and what the the hills of uh, Hawaii and the you know, the far um, archipelago out there and, uh, uh, toward Russia, where he flew, he was looking for a submarine, some submarine patrol. So that early military influence was important to him. Uh, but then, you know, I think the most important thing that I see in his work is that he believed in human communication. He was not one of these, I, I always give uh, Ashbery and these people a bad rap, but he wasn't an ivory tower poet. He, didn't, he really wanted to be useful. He really wanted to connect with the world. He believed that one man or woman talking to another person, a human being talking to each other, this is really what poetry was about for him. And that's what, I think that's the, 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 the guy, mind you, he was a very sophisticated poet, and uh, you know, a lover of the opera, and, and at the highest levels of intellectual ability, he was there, you know. Tom, you could speak to this, because you've looked at him a lot. I, w I would, if I think you could hear me. Uh, it, uh, he was trained formally, so you would find, you know, Villanelle, Sonnet, Sistina, and any number of formal uh, English tradition poetry passed from now and again. But mostly, he, and he wasn't narrative, he wasn't, I mean, he's lyrical in a way, but he's not lyrical in a traditional way. Uh, I think, again, he is more meditative. He does want to communicate about the human condition. He has absolutely no illusions about who and what we are. He has a poem, for example, about how people feel they've suffered too much, or how much they sort of put on pretense of being a victim. He says, you know, no, no, that, that's, you know, smell the human consequences of choice, of love, and of your own actions, a poem called Consequences. Absolutely just drills down and says, you know, there's a lot of this public display of dismay about the world we live in, but no, we really are who we are. We chose what we would choose to be. And the poem I wrote, read briefly from about how the vulture compassion, when you stop and think about compassion as a vulture, <laughs> you will get a sense of how deeply he looks at, and hard he looks at human beings. And he does communicate, he does find that point through his formality, but then also in a more open line and language, the communication. He has another poem, uh, in which he talks back to W.H. Auden, who famously said, poetry changes nothing. But he says, yes, it does. You know, it's small things. It's the way we basically build a character and build ourselves, build you know, our memories, build relationships. So those, are, I think, are the things that I walk away from his poetry from, uh, carrying in my heart. And again, the sense that he sentences us to that self-examination so that we don't create illusions about both ourselves and about our, the world we live in, which is difficult. And he has no illusion about that. Richard, I hope you don't mind if I say something rather personal about you. No, it's about William, too. I didn't meet William until after he'd had his stroke. So I met um, a poet who essentially had aphasia and had a hard time coming up with words. Um, but he, it seemed to me like he understood nearly everything. Like, uh, I remember being in the living room in that house 
with another poet, and he said, you know, show me some of your work, and she showed a page of hers, and I showed a poem of mine, I'll tell you later who it was, and then he goes and looks at her, who happened to be blonde, and I had black hair then, and he goes, your poetry, very light. What he meant by that was light imagery, I mean, a lot of imagery of light, literally. And then he looks at me and he says, yours, very dark. <laughs> which was absolutely true. And Richard gave him such a life after that stroke and worked with him to give him everything he needed to have a very happy life then, as much as he could have. And let me tell you one other thing that surprised me that I don't even understand. Okay, so we had this difficulty talking. And we were sitting and I said, Richard, I love that poem of yours and it was probably um, the illiterate. Yeah. So, he takes the book, Partial Accounts, and he goes through the table of contents. So he was reading, and then he points to it, and it says the illiterate. And I was astonished with how he could find it. I mean, that wasn't easy, going through and finding it. So, I mean, it was really very interesting what he could and couldn't do, and mainly, you know, that he was blessed to have Richard, and Richard was blessed to have him, a mutual blessing. So at one point we were talking to the doctors and, and, and one guy said, boy, by now we'd have been throwing plates at each other. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was not always easy, you know. It was, uh, but we did travel went to India, Ireland, Russia. We had a great time and he came back with speech. Barbara used to be in charge of the Speech Language Hearing Association. Asha. And Asha, and uh, well, with the AARP, and she's a speech writer and high level uh, word person, but also thinking concept person. And Annie Glenn, Senator Glenn's wife, had a stutter when she was a young woman, and she wanted to develop a prize for somebody in the arts who had overcome a great handicap. And uh, as she had done. and so uh, James Earl Jones was one of the first ones that won it, but William was like the second one. It was a great black tie thing at the at the Kennedy Center, and it was very fancy. And Barbara, th this is not nepotism, Barbara. You are getting this award because Genuine. you are a great translator and a good, very good poet. But um, it didn't hurt to have Barbara in the wings, you know, kind of recognizing William's uh, really triumph over this aphasia that he had. And uh, it was a wonderful evening. You know, glass trophy, the whole deal. It was really nice. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Oh, we didn't show the Meredith film, did we? Maybe we can end with that. Oh, we have another question, Jonas. As, as a meditative poet, who would you say were William's influences of, of his elder generation before him? and? other previous centuries? Well, one, of the, one of the obvious uh, points of reference is Robert Frost. Yeah. Uh, before that, he was contemporary, certain, more or less, yes, wasn't he? Preceded. Yeah. Preceded to the uh, And he would talk about how Frost could have it both ways, both literally and figuratively. His language would communicate mm -hmm. what was sort of below the surface. And W.B. Yeats, one of the trips that was taken by Richard and William included a trip to Yeats's uh, grave and to Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, Polinaire as well, an English oh, poet yeah. at the end of the 19th century. Uh, also Shelley uh, is someone who uh, William wrote about and is evident in one of the poems called Roots, which I did not cite. He talks to, to a muse who's much more yeah. relaxed than Mrs. Lemington, who's a neighbor who looks after him, fusses after him, make sure he starts the day properly and cares for the community. Uh, and it ends with her talking about how, if you look at a particular 19th century image, uh, it looks like, say, a girl in a swing on a tree. You turn it over and you see that it's the roots of the tree and what look like bouquets of flowers or branches or whatever, a bird's nest, or rocks, and the tree is gripping them in sort of fierce control. And she relates the narrative story that's somewhat common in poetic circles, and that is that uh, Shelley once thought he met himself having died. So it's an out-of-body experience, which is not uncommon. And it is a feeling of 
would you want to meet yourself on the other side of the grave? And how do you get back? And she talks about, again, she's William's muse. And he goes back and forth about what that experience is. Again, that deepening below the, the line. And so those, I think, are probably four or five. You know, mm -hmm. Yeats and Shell. And little Keats, as I say, I look at the poem about a Korean woman seated by a wall as sort of an inversion of that recent urn, which ends with, Truth is beauty, yeah. beauty, truth is all you know and you need to know. And he just says, it shatters my philosophy. And so when we get to the wreck of the threshing, we get the same sort of feeling that all of that has been, the whole sense of grounding has disappeared. And so it then becomes relational. And so that is really why we get to enable love, so mm. what I would call the core tenet of how we came to believe, even though compassion can be a vulture we can maintain, faith in one another in, in our lives. We have a couple more minutes here, and I'm wondering, uh, we didn't show the film, but would you like to see the man in, in the flesh? We have there's a, a short film, it's really short, which shows um, William uh, when he won the Lifetime Achievement Award for Connecticut, and you'll see who he was in that point. And if, if you'll indulge me, we 